praise God. Part five of Overwhelming Victory. That is the title today or the series that we're in, Overwhelming Victory. And today, we've entitled part five, Just Because. Just Because. Now, we know we're in February, and Valentine's Day is right around the corner. And so, ladies, I know that's always nice when you're... When your Valentine gives you some Valentine stuff, right? That's always neat. And I mean, if, and if that didn't happen, guys, we, we would be in trouble, right? I mean, that is definitely, if you're going to do it, some flowers and candy and whatever it is you do, you definitely got to do it on that day, right? But ladies, somebody said, shook their head up. But don't you love it, though, ladies, when it's not Valentine's Day, it's not a birthday? And guys, I'm not going to say this to put you under pressure, but you've done this before. Maybe it's been a while. But don't you love it, ladies, when when just because he comes in the door with some flowers? Now, that's really neat, right? Now, some of y'all looking like, that's never happened to me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But hopefully, it, maybe it's been a while. But so, you know, And guys, maybe it's been a while since we've done that. I've done it. I was in the grocery store the other day, and I was looking at flowers. And I hadn't gotten Jim some flowers in a while. And I didn't. I don't remember what happened. I got sidetracked. But I've done that pretty regularly. Just, just because. Just because. And this morning, that's the title of our, our message today. In, in, in Overwhelming Victory Part 5. Just because. Just because. Just because. I want to I look with you this morning at a little story that sets this thing up. And this is, I think, one of the most misunderstood encounters that Jesus has had with someone that's recorded in scripture. Oftentimes when he has an encounter, it's really easy. You see the big picture or if he shares something, later he'll explain it in more detail and you, you, you get it. This one though, it, it almost leaves it up to us. You know, he talks about how, how good it is when a king uh, digs for the matter. You know, we're priests and kings and when we search out a thing, how good it is. And I think this is one of those stories where he doesn't just lay things out so simply, but he gives us the opportunity to kind of figure this out just a little bit. I want to look at it with you. Matthew 15, seven verses, beginning in verse number 21. It says, Then Jesus left Galilee, and he went north to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Gentile woman who lived there came to him pleading, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, for my daughter is possessed by a demon that torments her severely. But Jesus gave her no reply, not even a word. In other words, he just totally ignored her. Then his disciples urged him to send her away. Tell her to go away, they said. She is bothering us with all her begging. So basically, you get it that she didn't just stop with that one request. She kept on and kept on and kept on. And then Jesus said to the woman, "I was sent to help the help. I was sent to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel." But she came and worshipped him, pleading again, "Lord, help me!" Jesus responded, "It isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs." And listen, many would say, did he just call her a dog? She replied, that's true, Lord, but even dogs are allowed to eat the scraps that fall beneath their master's table. Dear woman, Jesus said to her, your faith is great. Your request is granted. And her daughter was instantly healed. Now, what was that story all about? What is that? And it got a little rough in there. You know, if Jesus seemingly calls this lady a dog, what is this all about? And here's what I see in this. And, and maybe there's more things I'm, I'm pretty sure that I don't see. But here's what I do see. And I think that this only comes by, by way of revelation through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to be our teacher. Like, I, I'm thankful for Sunday school teachers and people I, I grew up hearing them teach me things. But listen, no one can teach you like the Holy Spirit can teach you. And one of, our, one of our issues is we've relied too much on man teaching us. And so therefore, we don't trust the voice of the Spirit because we often run it through the voice of man first to see if the Spirit's right. When in reality, it should be the opposite. You, really, we should run it through the Spirit first to see if man's telling you the truth. We've kind of flipped that. 
And, and so what is he saying here? What's the deal here? And I really believe the Holy Spirit showed me this, and here, here's what I want to share with you. This woman who was a Gentile woman, and no, Jesus had not come to bring the gospel and the good news to the Gentiles. And Gentiles is any non-Jew. We're Gentiles. If you're not Jewish this morning, you're a Gentile. And Jesus came not to give the good news to the Gentiles, but the Jews. But at the same time, we see several encounters throughout Scripture where he encountered Gentile people, non-Jews, and he loved them and his goodness came forth. I mean, one that comes to my mind right away is the woman at the well. She was a Samaritan woman. She's Gentile. She was, she was in a mess. And Jesus goes out of his way to meet her and to connect with her and to give her this living water that she could not find in any relationship, in any situation, or any circumstance. It's what she'd been missing the whole time. And, and this Gentile woman, Jesus gives what, her what she's looking for. She's looking for something. She didn't even know what it was. And as a result of that, her life is transforming. She goes out in the town and just tells it. And the whole town turns out and begs Jesus to stay. And he stayed two or three more days teaching these people. So we see these encounters that he has with regular people. Now here's what I see in this story. Here's what I see in this story. This woman's first response to him, and she knew she was a Gentile. She knew she was a non-Jew, and if she knew anything about Jesus, she probably knew what his mission was. But here's what happened. She comes to him, and she's using, she's using the Jewish lingo to get his attention. She says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then she goes and she explains her problem. She describes really what is a huge mountain in her life. She describes really what is a huge, massive giant standing before her, and she had no answers until she comes to the Lord. And, and she says, Jesus, thou son of David. Jesus, thou son of David. What was she doing? Listen, she was, she was using the Jewish lingo to get his attention. And he paid her no mind. And listen... He brought her to the place of no pretense where she would acknowledge openly and publicly before him who she was, period. And then she said, well, you know what? Even the dogs get scraps from the table. And he said, and then it shifts. And he said, woman, because of your great faith, your daughter is healed. And she was healed in that same hour. He wanted to get her to this place, and this is important. This is, what, this is the theme of the whole day. He wanted to get her to the place of no pretense, no pretense, where she knew that what she experienced from God was nothing more than God's goodness on her life. End of story. It wasn't about who she was or who she wasn't. It wasn't about Jewish anything. It was just simply, listen, it was just simply because he is good. And this is important. This is important. And we're in part five of overwhelming victory. You know, God wants to do some overwhelming victory in our lives, in your life. Listen, when and if you are faced with a giant and a mountain and a circumstance that you don't know how you're going to get past... God wants to be God in your life. God wants to do something powerful in your life. Listen, I might mess up your religion. You ready? Not because you pray enough. Not because you read your Bible enough. Not because you come to church enough. Not because you give enough. But because he's good enough. And that messes up religion. Now, it's good to read your Bible. It's good to pray. It's good to go to church. It's good to give. But somehow we get this mentality in our mind that, man, you know, I just need to do this to get this. I need to do that, and that will trigger this. And a lot of times we're pulling out Old Testament verses to try to describe a new covenant theology, which you cannot do. I like Second Chronicles. If my people are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I'll hear from heaven and heal their land. I like that. And it's a great Old Testament verse. But can I help you? 
It doesn't work in the new covenant anymore because the cross made a difference. And this is, what, this is where church folk are missing it even today. And I think more and more of us are coming, we're getting woke. We're getting woke. We're getting woke to how gracious God's grace really is. And for many of us, it doesn't happen until we move from pretense and we get real with God and ourselves. She says, you know what? She changed her whole tune. She went from, Jesus, thou son of David, to, you're right, I don't deserve this. But even the dogs get scraps from the table. And he said, paraphrasing, girl, that's faith right there. You get it. You realize right now that I'm not going to do this because you deserved it, because you approached me in the right way, because you said all the right things. I'm just going to show up in your situation because I'm good and I love you. Now, this is the verse that I've got saved to the end. But since Chris said it a while ago, only coordinated by the Holy Spirit, can I help you? Because Romans 12, 2 tells us this, 12, 24. It's the goodness of God that leadeth men to repentance. It's the goodness of God that leadeth men. You know what? I grew up in hellfire preaching. Hey, you know, and I saw people get saved. I saw people get saved. And there's a glory in it, but it's not the most glorious. I'm just being honest with you. <laughs> Turn and burn. I've, I've heard it. I've heard it all my life. I grew up in that, right? And it'll get you saved. But it doesn't help you experience the goodness of God. That kind of preaching will scare the hell out of you. It really will. It'll make you want to give your life to Jesus because you don't want to burn. Let's just be honest. I'm being real. Right? But you know what it doesn't do? It doesn't sustain you every day of your life. Because people don't live in that place for long. Living under the guise of if you don't do this, something bad's going to happen to you. That mentality only goes so far. It, it can't sustain you in life. I mean, you get over that eventually. That threat, I mean, I mean your mama saying, if you do that, I'm going to wear your tail out. Right? Well, when you, when you got to about 12 years old, that just didn't work anymore. It worked when you were five. It might have worked when you were six, right? But at 12, you, you know, you, you might have... I don't know, you, you, you talk back a little bit, you're feeling your oats, you know what I mean? That, that, that thing just doesn't, it doesn't hold you captive like it, it's not life-changing. That if you don't do this, God's going to get you, and God's going to do this. I'm sorry, I know I, and I know I'm messing some people up, and I'm not trying to, I'm just being honest. Listen, listen, the law had a glory to it, and I'm not saying if you don't preach like that and teach like that, you're not going to get some people saved, you will. But if your only goal is to get them to heaven, I would say there's more to it than that. David said, I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I don't think God just wants to get you to heaven. I know he wants to get you to heaven. But I also believe that he wants you to experience his goodness and his love and his grace while you're on this earth so that you become what? A living, breathing testimony of the goodness of God. People aren't drawn to God because they're afraid of him. They're drawn to God because he's good. And it's the goodness of God, Romans 12, 24. It's the goodness of God that leadeth men to repentance. And listen, and the only reason is just because. Well, how can you say that, man, with such conviction? Moses asked God a question. He, had, he, he was getting to know this, this, this God, this, this El Shaddai, this Jehovah I mean, he'd just come out of Egypt where he saw God do the most amazing things. He led these people uh, across dry land through the Red Sea. He saw Pharaoh's army destroyed. He's up on the mountain. He's in this mountaintop experience with the Lord. And he said, God, he said, I just, I want to, I want to see you. I want to, I want to see you. I want to know you. I want to experience you. I don't want you to talk to me in a cloud anymore. I want to, I want to, I want to face to face with you. And God said, well, Moses, I'm going to put you in this rock. Then I'm going to take my hand and I'm going to cover it because no man can see me and live. Now, here before I get to James, you know what James tells us? He says, if you lack wisdom, 
You can ask the Lord and he'll give it to you liberally and without condemnation. This mentality that, see, this is how the devil tricked Eve. He tricked Eve by thinking, well, you know, God gave you all this stuff, but you know, there's a little something he wants to hold back from you. Right? This mentality that God wants to hold back something from us. That, no. Listen, if you need wisdom, if you, if, you, if you want to know something, you know what you can do? You can ask the Lord. And he will give it to you liberally and without condemnation. Liberally and without condemnation means I, he doesn't say, well, I'm going to do it, but you shouldn't be asking me stuff like this. There's, there's no, there's no, he gives it liberally without condemnation. Now, James was written much later than Moses' encounter with the Lord, but the same principle still applies. That was in his nature. And as Moses says, I want to see you and know you. Here's what he said. I'm going to put my hand over this rock, and my goodness is going to pass before you. And sure enough, Moses peeked out from the cleft of that rock as that hand. Maybe he peeked through one of the fingers, and he saw the goodness of God passing that way. Listen, and God doesn't just love. God is love. The essence of who he is is love. And you might say, well, I know, but I can read scriptures, man, where God wipes some people out and he does some stuff. Yes, he does, but you know what he does? He does that as a good, good father. Even in the New Testament, in the New Testament, Ananias and Sapphira imposturing themselves as true believers to get, into, to get in the fold, to get in the flow of those New Testament believers God doesn't tolerate it. Why? Because he wants to protect his children. Just like any good-natured, sweet mama in this room, just as sweet as she can be, you mess with one of those kids and you see what happens. That's, that's where we get the phrase, mama bear. Mama bear, come, you don't want no mama bear up on you. Mama bear don't care how big the threat is. It doesn't care how loud the threat is. It, is, it goes into protect mode. I'm protecting my baby. And that's how the father is for you and me. And where did mama get that from? She got that from him, who is neither mother nor father to us. He's, he, you know what he is to us? He's everything. He's everything. And so what he does in our lives, listen, and this victory that he wants us to live in in our lives, this overwhelming victory, he wants to do it in our lives. Listen, not because you got your mess together. Not because you are religious enough and you do all the right stuff and you know all the right lingo. He just simply wants to do it. Because he's good and he's God. Now they got my coat clock covered up back there with these decorations. So I'm guessing, y'all, okay? I'm going to look at my watch here a little bit. I want to read you a story. I want to read you a story. You know this story. I never get tired of looking at these stories in Scripture. Never get tired of them. David is faced with a, with a, with a, with a Goliath in the book of Samuel, and I don't even have the reference up to all the verses, but it's in the book of Samuel. I'm going to read several verses, and I'm going to skip a few. When David is faced, or when Israel is faced with this overwhelming giant of a situation, which was a real giant, by the way, how did God respond? How did, what did he do here? And what can we learn? I want us to look at this story in detail. And, uh, and we'll begin here with verse 1, right here in 2 Samuel. It says, The Philistines now mustered their army for battle. So the two massive armies, Israel and the army of Philistine, came out to do battle. And as you can imagine, there's this gulf or maybe valley or canyon or something in the middle. And they're faced opposite of one another. And here's what it says. And now the Philistines mustered their army for battle and camped between Sokoth of Judah and Azekah, Azekah, of, uh, yes, that word. Saul countered by gathering his uh, Israelite troops near the Valley of Elah. So the Philistines and the Israelites faced each other on opposite side, on, on opposite hills with the valley between them. Then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out in the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was nine foot tall, he wore a bronze helmet that, uh, and his bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leg armor and he carried a bronze javelin in it, on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy as, and as thick as a weaver's beam tipped with an iron spear that weighed 15 pounds. So the tip of his spear was 15 pounds. 
His armor bearer, that's the person who carried armor in front of him, walked ahead of him carrying his shield. Goliath stood and he shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight, he called. I am the Philistine champion, but you are only the servants of Saul. Choose one to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send a man who will fight me. And when Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. A nine-foot terrorist right there by the name of Goliath. And he's issuing these threats. And he said, just send, you, send your best man out here. And we'll fight and we'll see who wins this thing. Now then Jesse, David's son, sends Jesse to the battle line to take some bread and food to his brothers who were there. They were soldiers in the army. And as David is making his way through camp, we pick this up in verse number uh, 26. It says, David asked the soldier standing nearby, What would a man get for killing this Philistine and ending the, his defiance of Israel? So Saul, the king, had already put out a decree. He says, If there's anybody that would fight this, this, this Goliath and win, I'm going to give you a great bounty. And David's inquiring. He hears there's a bounty. He hears there's a great reward for the one who kills Goliath. He said, What, 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 what is the ransom? What, 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 what is the reward? Who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? And I really like the King James and New King James right here because in this verse he says this, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine anyway who is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? Who is this person that has no covenant with God and God has no covenant with them that's out here defying the armies of the living God? God's covenant demand is the blessing. And in Israel's, in this era, the covenant, the, 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 the picture to the man that he's in covenant with God was circumcision. Now, the Apostle Paul tells us in the New Covenant that it's not about that anymore. He, he says in the New Covenant, it's about the circumcision of the heart. But David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that defies an army of the living God? And as these men gave David the same reply, they said, yes. That is the reward for killing him. And they told David what the reward was. But, but when David's oldest brother, Elab, heard David talking to the men, he was angry. What are you doing around here anyway, he demanded. What about those few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? I know, you're about, uh, I, I, I know about your pride and your deceit. You just want to see the battle. So David's meeting opposition, so he inquires. And the, and the word was, you'll get the king's daughter in marriage, you'll get bounty, you'll get wealth, and you'll never have to pay taxes. And so David said, what'd you say, Mr. Willis? What you talking about, Mr. Willis? Google that if you're older than, if you're younger than 30, right? And then, then his brothers are ridiculing him. They're, they're trying to shame him. Said, hey, who's, you should go back and take care of those few sheep. When all that was done, David says, what have I done now, David replied. I was only asking a question. He walked over to some others and asked the same thing and received the same answer. And then David's question was reported to King Saul, and the king sent for him. So word gets to Saul that David is going around the camp asking about this reward for the one that faces off with this Philistine in battle and wins. And so, he, so Saul brings David in, and David says to the king, Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way that you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said, and when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by its jaw and club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too. For he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Saul finally consented, 
All right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. And then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet, a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped on the sword, the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again, and he picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them into a shepherd's bag. And then armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Goliath walked out toward David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering with, in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come on over here. And I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. And then you know the story. David reached in that shepherd's bag and he pulled out one of those five smooth stones. He slung it around in that shepherd's sling and released it. And that, that stone hit Goliath right here. Some scholars believe he was wearing a helmet, Goliath was, that had metal that came down his brow and had a square. You've seen Roman you know, uh, uh, soldiers with these helmets and said that it had an opening right here. Maybe it did, maybe it didn't. But wouldn't that be interesting? That that, that that stone released from that sling was powerful enough and accurate enough in its aim that it landed right there, center mass, and that giant fell. And you know what's interesting about it? He didn't fall back, he fell forward. And then if you continue to read the story, David goes over to Goliath, takes out his own sword, and takes his head off. And that's not to be morbid. What is that about? That's to say, listen, this wasn't just victory. This was an overwhelming victory. And, and at that moment, the Israelite army chased after the Philistines and completely just routed them. It was a great, great victory. All at the hands, listen, of a little ruddy teenage shepherd boy three takeaways this morning as we wrap this up i want to share these with you here's the first one you ready david relied on the covenant on the covenant god had with israel you know what's interesting these israelites were terrified and they were paralyzed in fear there was no great faith movement in that mass body of people Everybody wasn't turning from their wicked ways and praying and seeking God's face. They were paralyzed in fear. They were afraid. There was nobody, there was nothing happening spiritual, spiritually that would rustle up God's vengeance against the enemy that day. Isn't that interesting? And then God picks the most least likely. It would have been one thing if it had been another match, some other really the biggest guy in Israel, brave, brave, full of tenacity, ready to go fight. I mean, that would have been a feat. That's like two Super Bowl teams battling it out to see who wins, right? You know, both equally matched. That would have been a great thing. But God takes the most likely, least likely of things, and he uses it that day, and it's this fearless. I mean, he is absolutely fearless. David, and the first thing he does, listen, is he leans on, he draws strength from this covenant that he knows that God has with him. And that's why he talks about this, who is this uncircumcised Philistine, Philistine that defies the armies of the living God? Who does he think he is? That's the first thing he did. And listen, when we're faced with a giant, and I hope you're not facing one right now, you know, you know, if life, if life is life long enough in your life, you'll probably face something at some point. And when those times come, listen, we can just remind ourselves, hey, you know what? God has a covenant with me. It's not about my covenant with God. It's about the covenant God made with me. God gave me a covenant. And in that covenant, listen, I'm the head and not the tail. I'm to be victorious. Paul said I'm more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus who loved me. And, in, and it's in those moments, listen, that we can remind ourselves of the covenant. And with that, listen, the covenant promises that God's given us. 
And when I say God's not just concerned about getting you to heaven, that's why I really believe he wants us to take advantage of all the seven components of salvation. And if you look up the word salvation, it's the Greek word sozo, S-O-Z-O, and it literally means to be saved, healed, delivered, preserved, protected, made prosperous, and made whole. I don't think God just wants to get us to heaven on the sweet by and by, in the sweet by. I think he wants to show himself victorious in our lives right now, in everyday life when things are going good, but on those occasions where you face a giant or you face a mountain and you don't know how you're going to handle it. I believe it's in those moments that he wants us to be reminded that, listen, God's got a covenant. God's established a covenant with me. And it's not about my covenant with him because a covenant requires someone to be faithful and obedient. And it's not about my faithfulness and my obedience. It's about his faithfulness and his obedience. And his obedience to his word. And his faithfulness to me, listen, when I'm not even faithful. That's, that's how he works. Listen, if, if the reality of this were, were dependent on anything about us at all, we'd be toast. We would, let's just be honest, we would be in a mess. And all that preaching like that, that wants to get you to live right and do right, which it's good to live right and do right. But that, that, but that doesn't cause God to do anything. You know what causes God to do something in your life? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Listen, when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What causes him to do that is just the fact that he's good. And just because he wants to. He wants to do good things in our lives. Amen. That helps me. Because when I have a bad day and I have a day where I miss it, I can quickly get myself right back up and realize, you know what? It ain't about me anyway. It's always been about him. Amen. Now, see, I know that goes contradictory, maybe to some things you thought. But check your heart. Check your heart. Does that bring peace to you? Does that bring peace? Does that bring one of these in your, in your heart? Oh, wow. You know it does. Because that's what the gospel is meant to do. And the gospel isn't the gospel of you doing right and then God will do this. The gospel is that in, you were, in, in while you were yet without Christ, a sinner, Christ died for you. That's the gospel. Can I help you? You will never, ever do anything or enough of anything to deserve receiving the goodness of God, period. It's just impossible. Just impossible. Here's the second thing David did. You ready? He drew strength from his past victories. He drew, this thing is doing this again, y'all. Bear with me. He drew strength from his past victories. I'm going to come up with a new thing. Y'all ready for this? I'm going to try something different. Let's see. Can we do Whoa. All right. We got a whole different flow. Can you hear me now still? Good. Listen to this. He drew strength from his past victories. He's like, you know what, I, I've never faced a Goliath before. But I, I, and it wasn't a bear or a lion that he faced. It was bears and lions, plural. If you read it, it just clears the bell. There were just times as a shepherd that he faced lions and bears that had come to attack his sheep. And this little boy did some pretty crazy things. Even back then, chased after a lion. You should be glad when the lion finally leaves. Now, he chased after him, clubbed him, caught one by the jaw, and clubbed him to death. He's fearless. He's fearless. I believe God wants us to be fearless. The world and its system of kill, steal, and destroy wants us to be fearful. But our Father wants us to be fearless. No fear. He drew strength. He was going to face a Goliath. He'd never faced a Goliath before. But he's thinking, you know what? God did this for me. He delivered me in this moment. He gave me the strength to do this, which I couldn't have done anyway by myself. And I know he's going to give me victory here. He drew strength from his past victories. And then here's the last one. You ready? David stuck with five smooth stones versus man's weapons. You know, there's an old saying, dance with the one that brung you. Dance with the one that brought you. 
David knew something about the grace of God before many people ever did. He wrote those psalms out there in that shepherd's, on the shepherd's field, and he would write music to the Lord, and he would, he would sing to the Lord, and he would worship the Lord, and out there all by himself, all by himself. And you know what it did? It elevated him from being the, this little shepherd boy to being the king that eventually replaced Saul. And you know, you know what Samuel said when God sent Samuel the prophet to David's house to anoint him to be the next king of Israel? You know what God said to Samuel? He said, quit crying over Saul. He said, because I have found me another who's after my heart. Who's after my heart. And I would hear that scripture through the years and think, wow, David had this some kind of special place or status with God that none of us will ever get to. Like, you know, David, just he just had something special that we'll, we'll, none of us will ever reach because he said he's a man after my own heart. But what was he really saying in light of the grace of God and, and in light of what we know? You know what, he, you know what God was saying? He said, I have found me a man, listen, who's in pursuit of my heart. I have found me a man, and that word after means to be in pursuit of. He says, I have found me a man that's in pursuit of my heart. Listen, you know what will make God show up in our lives more than anything? When we're in pursuit of his heart. And what is his heart? His heart is not judgment. His heart, his heart is not wrath. His heart is not God's going to get you. His heart is goodness and mercy and unfailing love. One of my favorite Bible teachers says it this way. He says, good things happen to people that know God loves them. Good things happen to people that know God loves them. And I believe that. I believe that. See, we, we love to challenge people to be better, to get better. at. So I need to get better at this. Let me tell you, here's the only thing we need to get better at. You ready? Going after the heart of the Father. That's the only thing I need to get better at. Now, what is going after? Going after means getting a continual understanding of who he really is and how he operates. And Romans tells us the goodness of God leadeth men to repentance. And that word repentance, you know what repentance means? It means returning to the high place. Returning to, re means to redo, re, re it means to go back. And pent, pentance, pent means high place, pentacle, penthouse. It's, it's a high place. So when we repent, it's not about saying I'm sorry a hundred times and, and, and crying. Repentance is just having a change of heart and a change of mind and leaving that low place where the devil wants you to stay and you repent. You have a change of heart and you have a change of mind and you return back to the high place, which is where you came from to start with. We all came from the Father. Listen, and when we repent, we're returning back to him. We're returning back to the high place. And he says, the goodness of God leadeth men to repentance. Listen, what he's saying is, listen, when you, when you experience and live in my goodness, it draws you closer to me. It draws you closer to me. If you think I'm this God that's getting ready to bop you on the head the next time you have a bad thought or the next thing you do wrong, I'm just ready to get you anytime I can, which the devil's behind that, by the way. And, 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 and listen, listen, even, even, even the best of us can be misled and confused. We've made, we've made the very simple thing so difficult. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So that whoever read their Bible enough, prayed enough, went to church enough, tithed enough. No. So that whosoever just believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And then 17 says, And God sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be sozoed, saved, healed, delivered, preserved, protected, made prosperous and made whole. Made prosperous and made whole. Now listen, you know what I'm sharing with you this morning? I'm just sharing with you the gospel. I am just, and what is it? What is the gospel? The gospel defined is the good news. Did you think you were going to come here and get some bad news today? I'm just sharing with you the good news. And, and listen, the good news is really that good. 
And I would say the good news is a lot gooder than we can even imagine. And I know I just made a word up. Amen. Here's the last thing. Here's the last thing. Listen, David stuck with what got him there. And what got him there wasn't man's way of doing it. It wasn't that armor, that shield, and that helmet. He went and got five smooth stones. Why five? Why did he get one? He only took one to kill Goliath. Why five? Five is a number of grace. It's a number of grace in Scripture. David knew to defeat that giant, it was going to take a work of grace. And what is grace defined? It is God's unmerited, undeserved favor and blessing. In one's life. Unmerited. Undeserved. Means you can't do enough to earn it. You can't do enough good things to keep it. He relied that day on the very thing that got it all started for him. He found him five smooth. Only need one of them. In the natural. But the picture there is much greater. What he was relying on was the grace of God. Amen. The goodness of God. The, 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 just the goodness of God. Amen. This morning, I want us to be encouraged. Here's what I believe. The Father wants to do good things in your life just because He's good. And you know what that does when you let that sink in? Let me tell you what it doesn't do. It doesn't make you want to go sin. It makes you want to worship. It makes you just want to worship. It makes you want to draw close to Him. It makes you want to pray in your car on the way to work when you ain't praying because you got to check this off your list because the preacher told you you had to pray X number of hours a day. You're just doing it because you want to talk to this good, good God that's so good to you that shows up in your life when you least deserve it. Wow. And you know what you're doing when you do that? You're repenting. You're just returning to the high place because the goodness of God leadeth men to repentance. And that was my last verse. Got it right here, Chris. Romans 2, 24. The goodness of God leads you to repentance. Amen. So this morning, that's the message. And this message is good news. I don't know what you think you were going to hear. But I can tell you what you're going to hear. Here's what you can't expect. If you ever come here, and I hopefully you'll be back, see some visitors this morning. We're glad to have you. If and when you come here, here's what you're going to hear. You ready? You're going to hear the good news. The focus isn't, on, isn't about how bad you are, because we're all bad. He says, even the best of us, our righteousness is as filthy rags. It's not going to be about how bad you are. It's going to be about how good he is. And let me tell you, his goodness is a lot bigger than your badness. Amen? A lot bigger. He took a murderer on the Damascus Road and gave him a Jesus encounter and turned that dude's whole life around. Paul, Saul became Paul just from that one encounter. Did Paul deserve that? He's he's on his way to to execute and, and persecute Christian believers. I give you one story after another. Simon Peter, when he experienced the goodness of God, he got a boatload of fish. He got on his knees and he said, Lord, you need to get away from me. I'm not a good man. He was thinking the old way. He didn't realize that what he was going to encounter for the next three years had nothing to do with his goodness. And God wanted to take a rough as a cob fisherman and make a preacher out of him to preach the good news and the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the gospel. I don't know what you've heard that made that was called the gospel, but this is the gospel. This is the good news, and, and, and i, I got to help you. There's nothing bad in the good news. It's all good. It's all good. It's all good. This message, and you know what's so interesting? When, you are, when, when, when people, and I'm not talking about anything specific, when we're used to hearing something that isn't the truth for so long, and then you finally hear the truth, it can be like, man, that don't sound right. Not because I don't get that awe, ah, but because I've never quite heard it that way before. Don't let that be your litmus test to the truth. Let the Holy Spirit be your guide. Amen. What I'm talking about right now is the good news. And let me tell you what I believe is going to happen. And it's already started. 
it's been started, but we, in the days and years ahead, I, I think you're going to see it increase even more and more. And that is a gospel revolution in the earth. Because the good news is so good, and the devil has tried so hard to keep it from us. But he's defeated, and he's not going to be able to. And because, listen, hunger knows no bounds. If you get hungry enough, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna get past whatever is holding you back to get to what's good to eat. And I think that's going to happen. I, I know it's going to happen. I believe that, I, I believe that our, in our future, I don't believe our, 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 our best days are behind us. I believe the best days and the most glorious days are ahead of us. The Word says that the glory of the latter house, that's the church and the body of Christ, will be greater than that of the first. I really believe that we're, we're, we're on the very precipice, precipice, the very edge of what I think could be the, the, the third great awakening in the world. I really believe it's coming. How can you say that? Because look how bad it is out there. It's getting crazy. People are getting, it's, it's getting crazy. And, and listen, listen. The, the Lord will never be outdone by the darkness. He's never going to let the devil outdo him. All of that stuff is just the devil letting you know he knows what's about to happen. And he's trying all the harder to prevent and stop. But he's not going to be able to. Because I believe there's a tsunami of the truth of God's goodness and grace that's going to sweep through. Not just America, but I, th I believe through the nations. There's going to be a great outpouring of God's spirit. I think we could see a billion souls come into the kingdom and then at some point, this thing's going to come to an end. We're going to see the next phase. We're, we're in the age of grace right now. And don't you know that with every big show, there's always that crescendo. There's always the grand finale. Come on. I mean, I've had some concerts here, and, and the artists will walk off the stage, and you think it's over, and everybody's clapping, and then they come back out, and they do one more song. And it's usually your favorite. It's usually the one you were hoping they would do, and you would wonder, why didn't they do that song? Listen, we hadn't seen the grand finale yet, but it's coming. It's going to be the greatest outpouring that the world has ever known. First Reformation happened when Jesus Christ came out of that grave. The church was born and the world was set on fire. And then there was another great Reformation that happened really centered around Martin Luther. He was a, he was a priest, a Catholic priest in Germany. And he got the revelation that, you know what, this thing is not about keeping the law. It is about grace through faith and faith alone. And he wrote a thesis and he nailed it to the door of a chapel. He was executed, by the way, because no one wanted to hear that yet. But it ushered in. People started getting their own Bibles. And it ushered in a great awakening in world history. These are historical facts. God operates in threes. He operates in threes. I believe, I believe the third great awakening is right around the corner. And you know, what's gonna, you know what it's going to be centered on? The gospel of grace and God's goodness. And we're going to be like, wow. It was that simple the whole time. And I made this thing more difficult. You don't deserve anything. You might be a good mom, a good dad, a good student, a good whatever, whatever, whatever. And that's good. That's good. I mean, that's better than being bad. But can I help you? But that doesn't qualify you to deserve anything. Anything we get, any blessings we receive is just because he is good. And that's where he wants the focus to get back to. I feel like this is prophetic because I feel like that's the heart. What is prophetic? It's just saying what's on the Father's heart. This is what he wants us to understand. So you don't go into Wednesday feeling like you're dragging and maybe you hadn't prayed enough, read enough, done enough. You, your thoughts hadn't been good. And you're just wondering, man, am I sunk? You'll, just, you'll, you'll, you'll grab yourself and remind yourself like David. No, man, it's not about me. It's about him. And then you worship the Lord in that place. And then you just watch him overtake you and just feel you and just love on you, which is what he so wants to do. What he so wants to do. So this little boy of mine, we've got this thing where he loves for me to hold him when we have worship. 
And the last two, three weeks, my wife has told me, like, when I leave and I exit and go back there to say something to the guys, he gets upset. And so I came back a while ago. She's like, he does not like it when you walk past him right now during this moment. Like, he wants you to hold him. But here's what he don't know yet. I want to hold him more than he wants me to hold him. I love him more than he loves that. Amen. So though my arm is heavy, and I'm trying to worship with one hand, and he's getting heavier by the day, so it ain't getting any easier, and I feel like my arm's about to fall off because it's getting harder, I just do it anyway. I don't want to mess up that moment. I just love it. I just love it. Listen, the Father loves you so much. Don't let the lies of the adversary convince you and tell you any longer that you don't deserve to be in God's presence. That's for them. It's not for you. That's a lie. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, because I'm meek and I'm, I'm easy. I'm easy. Lionel Richie wrote that hymn, Easy Like Sunday Morning. Come on. Amen. Let's stand to our feet this morning. If you need a communion cup, will you lift your hand and our ushers will get you one? Let that play, guys. That's beautiful. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Anyone need a communion cup? Just lift your hand right there. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Mm. Thank you, Father. So here's our invitation this morning. And this is how we do it every single week. So if you're visiting here today, you didn't just happen to roll in on Communion Sunday because every Sunday is Communion Sunday here. That's how we do it. And we don't do this because we're trying to be cute or religious. We just do this because we fight. this is how we end it. Like, I could invite you to come up here and pray, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I would do that for many years. And I would go, and I'd cry and weep, and I'd think about how bad I was. And, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I'd get up more determined than ever. But by Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday, I'm back where I was. Unable. 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 But here's what I really believe he wants us to do. I believe the focus should never be on us but always on Him, because His goodness leads us to repentance. It's experiencing His goodness will transform your life from the inside out. So this morning, we just do what they would do in the first church, in the early church. What would they do? They would go from house to house, and they would break bread with one another. They would get into a place together, small groups, big groups, And they would center everything. It wasn't about who was preaching. It wasn't about who had the special music. They came together to take this together right here. The body and the blood of Jesus. Because Jesus had left them with something. He said, listen, I'm bringing you into a new covenant. And here's what you can do. As often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. You do this, and every time you do it, and you can do it any time you want, as often as you want. You just do this remembering what I've done for you through my body and through my blood. Now, let me help you. If that was only about getting you to heaven, then we'd only need the blood represented in the juice. That's all we'd need. But there are two pieces here. Why two? Because it's not about just getting you to heaven, as I've said several times. Praise God for that. Amen. But there's also the second part, and that's that bread that you hold in your hand. Now, what does that represent? That represents all the things that Jesus went through on that cross so that you and I never have to. Crown of thorns were placed upon his head. He was mocked. He was shamed. He was rejected. Because he went through all that, you and I will never be put to shame. We'll never be rejected. He was rejected by the Father so you and I would never have to be. By his stripes, 39 whips. They say that he had no skin on his back. You could see his bones. Oh, he went through all of that, listen, so that by his stripes we're healed. The chastisement of our peace was laid upon him. You know when Jesus was stripped bare and made naked and impoverished? He was on that cross. And, it, and the word tells us that he became poor so that we might become rich. And that word rich defined means fully supplied 
in need or want of nothing. Parents, don't you want your kids to be fully supplied in need or want of nothing? Of course you do. So why, do I, why would I thank my Father in heaven who uses gold as street pavement there would want me to be in need or want? He doesn't want me to be in need or want. He wants to supply my every need. And he did all those things for us, transferred them to us through his body on the cross. So here's what we do when we come to receive this. We come and we receive for whatever it is you need. The old folks would give you a dose of castor oil. Maybe some of you older ones in here remember that. Your grandma or somebody would give you, had a sniffle. They'd give you a spoonful of castor oil. And they'd just give it to you sometimes just because. And they said, well, why'd you do that? Just for whatever ails you. For whatever ails you. Listen, listen. For whatever ails you. It's the body and blood of Jesus that's been given to us. Listen, and here's what he says, freely given as to freely receive. It's not about you. And, and I'm, I'm going to help you. There's nothing that will disqualify you from receiving this. If Jesus is qualified to give it, he makes you qualified to receive it. So you receive it by faith. Amen. So today, this is my point of contact. I believe in laying on of hands. I believe that the woman with the issue of blood could touch his garment and she was made whole. But I can't do that. I can't touch his garment, but I could take this communion. And I believe that as I take the body and blood of Jesus represented in this cracker and this juice, I'm believing God right now that that's my point of contact. And I'm going to receive what it is I need today. So here's the invitation. Whatever it is you need today, do you need healing today in your body? I mean, seriously, is there something that needs healing in your body? As you take the bread and the cup today, would you receive your healing? Not because you deserve it, but because he's good. Amen. Do you need some peace in your heart and your mind? Maybe you're just full of fear. Receive the body and blood of Jesus. And as you do, receive that fearlessness like David. Just a free gift. Is there any area in your life that needs saving today? Maybe a relationship that needs saving. Maybe you need some fi a financial area saved. You need saving from this. Listen, he's the Savior, and he saves. And he wants, he wants to do it in every area of our lives. So whatever it is you need today, receive this today as we take the body and the blood of Jesus. We're going to pray. And if you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've never even gotten that party started where you've invited him into your heart and in your life, we're going we're to cover that. And Paul says it's really close to you, this whole salvation thing. He says it's in your heart and in your mouth. If you believe in your heart that Jesus is the Son of God and that God raised him from the dead and confess him with your mouth, you shall be saved. It's that easy. He that calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But that saving applies to every area in your life. So today, whatever it is you need, let's receive by faith in Jesus' name. Father, we just want to thank you this morning for your goodness, for your grace. Fathers, we pray together right here, right now. We declare today that Jesus is Lord over our lives. We declare that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died on that cross to pay the price for our sin. And to give us this eternal, zoe, God kind of life to the full till it overflows, this abundant life. And he rose again on the third day. So today I just declare that Jesus is Lord. And I receive today as a free gift everything that I need in my life. Healing for my body, my family, my loved ones, my finances, my peace. Whatever it is you need today, receive that by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Now receive the body and blood of Jesus this morning by faith. Mm. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Can we give him praise this morning? He's worthy. Amen. Come on. You can do better. Hallelujah. Come on. He's worthy. Amen. Praise God. Thank you for being here today. Hey, stay in fellowship and let's celebrate with the Cochran's this morning.
And we, we're not going to mess your lunch up, but we got some cake and some salty stuff back there, and we'll celebrate with them. Don't be in a hurry. We don't have to take anything down this morning. We can leave it right where we've got it for the next few weeks. Let's pray as we're dismissed. Father, we thank you. We just ask today that you would cause your grace to shine upon us, Father, that we would go forth in your love and in your power and in your anointing and in your protection from the coronavirus, any virus, disease, any ailment that hell could offer. We thank you that we're protected and we're surrounded by your favor everywhere we go. Surely your goodness and your mercy are following us all the days of our lives. And we're going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We give you praise for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Thank you for coming today.